It's good to be with you again. We're in Jerusalem today. What a wonderful opportunity we have. You get to visit Jerusalem with no jet lag. You're welcome. Uh, Jerusalem is at the center of so many things that God is doing in the earth. Uh, the more we fully understand Jerusalem, the more we'll understand what God is doing in our hearts and our lives. And so we're delighted to spend a few weeks here in the city. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the friends that have made such a difference in my life and in our congregation. Uh, I believe they'll be a blessing to you. You know, this year is the 50th anniversary of the reunification of the city of Jerusalem. It, it's a miracle, quite literally, of biblical proportions. Uh, we'll learn a bit more about that, but I'm delighted to welcome to the program today Chris Mitchell. Chris is the bureau chief, the Middle East bureau chief for CBN News. Uh, Chris, welcome. Well, Ellen, great to be with you. It's good to yeah. have you. We've been together in Tennessee many yes, times. Yes, we have. Yeah, so and it's, it's great to be here in Jerusalem. Well, I get to be on your turf this time. <laughs> You've been here in the Middle East now for more than 15 years mm -hmm. with CBN. Right. And Chris has had the privilege of reporting to Christians all over the world what's happening in this part of the world. And I wanted him to share with you today a little bit about his unique perspective. He's seen a lot of change. He's seen a lot of ideas come and go. And you have persisted. I admire your courage. <laughs> well, it's great to be here. It's a real privilege to be here. When we came uh, in August of 2000, my wife and three children, they were 16, 11, and 8 at the time. Uh, we came in the middle of August. The Intifada, the second Intifada, began the next month. So uh, it was a very challenging time of three years of suicide attacks, bus bombings, and shootings. Uh, but we felt God had called us and that he would protect us. And not only us, but you can imagine this as a parent, and I'm sure the viewers... Uh, he took care of our children during those uh, very vulnerable uh, ages for them. So it was uh, God's protection, sort of like living out Psalm 91, that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And he's protected us from then till now. You know, I think anybody that comes to Jerusalem, whether you come to visit or you come to stay, makes you feel like the scripture gets lived out in your life yeah. in a new way. My, my wife uh, compares it to this. She says, before you come to Israel, reading the Bible is like reading it in black and white. But after you come here, it's like reading it in color. And, and you can just see that right behind us. Most, uh, much of the New Testament uh, took place just behind us there in Mount of Olives, the, uh, the old city, the city of David. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's almost hard to believe when you walk the streets to realize what's happened in this That's place. Right. Yeah. In fact, we just interviewed somebody uh, last night, an NFL Hall of Famer, by the way, Mike Singletary yeah. from the Chicago Bears. And he said it's his first visit. He came here and he said to be at the place on the Jordan River, very likely near the place where Jesus was baptized, it revolutionized his life. And, uh, and that's the reaction of a number of people who come here for the first time, to be able to walk where Jesus walked, whether it's on the Jordan River here in Jerusalem or in the Galilee, it's, it can be revolutionary. You know, Chris, I, I think the part of the Middle East we hear the most about at home these days is ISIS mm -hmm. and what's happening in that part of the world. I, mm -hmm. I know you've been in some of those places. Can you share just a little bit about what you've been seeing? Yeah, we've been there uh, many times in northern Iraq, and the first time we went was in the summer of 2014 after ISIS really splashed on the global headlines, and they took over parts of Syria and northern Iraq. They were actually threatening the capital of Kurdistan, or Erbil, at that time. We had the opportunity to go there and visit refugees that had uh, been, been evicted, uh, fled there for their very lives by ISIS. Uh, the most moving things for me was meeting with Christians who had uh, come face to face with ISIS and they were given four choices. The first choice they had was they could leave their homes that they had stayed in for years, maybe generations. The second one they had was that they could stay, but they would have to pay what's called the jizza tax for non-Muslims. The third choice they had was they could deny their faith in Jesus Christ and become a Muslim. The fourth choice they had, they could die by the sword. So thousands of them fled. And my heart has been that the Western church needs to understand what has happened to their fellow believers, their brothers and Amen. sisters, uh, who fled ISIS. Right now, many of them have really left the area because they don't want to go back to their homes. And sometimes, uh, right now, they're refugees living in Erbil or other places, maybe Jordan. Uh, and so they really need the support, the prayers of their believers in the Western world and other parts of the world and uh, support them when they, when they can, raise their voice for them. Uh, but that was the legacy that ISIS had. And, and Alan, we were in a, a village called Karakosh uh, just a few months ago. In August of 2014, ISIS had come in. In fact, just a few hours before they came into the city, the church bells rang and people really spread word of mouth that you have to leave because ISIS is on their way. Mm. Almost 60,000 Christians left 
maybe just the few were left, the invalid or the elderly. And, uh, and we had the opportunity to go back to Karakosh after it had been occupied two years by ISIS. And we saw that churches were burned, monasteries were destroyed, uh, and, and they had burned homes. And they had desecrated almost every Christian symbol, especially the cross. And what it said to me as a Christian is that ISIS has this fanatical hatred uh, of the, the elemental symbol of Christianity, the cross, whether it was in a church or a monastery, even in a cemetery. And they had desecrated it uh, almost at will. They wrote on the walls. They said, we will crush you infidels. The Islamic State will uh, expand. And uh, we destroyed your crosses. And so that's the legacy that ISIS has left in many parts of the Middle East, especially there in northern Iraq. And uh, it's despite the fact that it looks like ISIS will be, uh, be conquered as, a, and as an Islamic State, as a caliphate, the ideology remains. And we see that whether it's in the streets of London, sometimes in places like Orlando or Sacramento, uh, we'll be fighting this ideology for a long time. It's not a new thing. Not at all, not at all. ISIS and is the current label. Exactly. But we've seen that hatred from radical Islam expressed in many ways we have. In, in, through the years. We have. In fact, it's gone throughout the Middle East in many ways. Uh, Islam historically has been a religion of conquest, uh, whether it's uh, northern Africa, parts of Europe, parts of the Middle East. Uh, in fact, right now in Egypt, many uh, ISIS has said that the Christians there are their favorite prey. Uh, they released a video earlier this year. On Palm Sunday this year, there were two terror attacks in two different churches in, uh, in uh, both uh, Tanta and uh, Alexandria. And so you can imagine what it's like for a Christian in Egypt to go to church on a Sunday and wonder if you're going to be safe, your children are going to be safe. Uh, and the Coptic Christians, they say that they are more the original inhabitants of uh, Egypt because their, their history goes back to, uh, back to almost biblical times. That's true. Christianity predates Islam in the Middle East. By hundreds of years, yeah. And Judaism predates Christianity. So right. there, there's more than, of years. more than one yeah, story to be told exactly. here. That's, you know, it, at home, inconvenience on, on church or, uh, is if the sermon goes a little bit long, that's right. Or we don't like the music the way it was presented. That's a little different for the church in Egypt. That's right, exactly. But, you know, I know if we go to kind of, if we step back a few years, you were in Cairo when the Arab Spring mm -hmm. broke into the media. Right. And there was kind of this euphoric reporting that the social media and Facebook were going to make the Mid Middle East a peaceful place. Well, You have a perspective on all of that? Uh, yeah, a little bit, uh, because... It seemed euphoric at the time, and that was when uh, Hosni Mubarak, the former president of Egypt, was disposed by, uh, by this Arab Spring. And there was a sense, an optimism among many, that there was going to be this sort of uh, peace breaking out in the Middle East, and, and yet the opposite happened. Uh, some people call it the Arab Spring. Uh, others call it the uh, Arab Winter, when radical Islam, at least for a season, in Egypt took place because Mohammed Morsi uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood became the, pre the new president uh, uh, of Egypt. And for a time, he seemed to be willing uh, to try to impose their brand of Islam on Egypt. Uh, thankfully, there was actually a, a, a revolt, actually the biggest political demonstration in human history. 33 million Egyptians went to the streets in Cairo and Alexandria and other places, and then they overthrew Mohammed Morsi. So now, in Egypt anyway, we have this uh, President El Sisi who is actually trying to fight ISIS in groups like that, especially in the Sinai and other places. Um, so that, that's the Arab Spring didn't turn out to what many people had uh, expected. But I think the point you made is important. and We don't hear it very often at home that the Egyptian people really went to stand in the streets. They did. To see the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood set aside. That's right. That that was an expression of the will of the Egyptian people. Yeah. There was an experience we had, just an anecdote that uh, sort of brought it home to me. We, we had a taxi driver, and he was just saying, we don't want that kind of Islam. I mean, this is a Muslim predominant country. Uh, most of the people there are Muslims. Uh, but they certainly didn't want that kind of Islam. They didn't want a caliphate. Uh, they didn't want to sort of spread this, uh, this idea of the Muslim Brotherhood anymore in Egypt and throughout the Middle East. The turmoil in the Middle East seems to be increasing, you know, That's from right. Lebanon to Syria to Iraq, all the way around to Libya, North Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole region, it feels like to me, is just boiling. Yeah. Do you, do you see that increase in recent years? 
Yes, definitely. And I think there's two, uh, two ways you can look at that. Is uh, certainly the Sunni brand of radical Islam, exemplified by ISIS, has taken over uh, parts of Syria and Iraq and, and fomented throughout places like the Sinai and Egypt and uh, Libya. Uh, on the other hand, you have the Shiite brand of radical Islam, exemplified by the Republic uh, of Iran. And I think they're competing interests right now. And the Sunni-Shiite divide, I think, explains much of what is happening in the Middle East today. Uh, there's a lot of people, including here in Israel, the United States, and sort of a Sunni coalition of nations like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, and, and Jordan, who see Iran as a mortal threat for the region, uh, not only the nuclear program that they have going, but also the fomenting of terror, whether in places like Yemen, uh, here in uh, trying to do things on the northern border uh, against on the Golan Heights with Israel. And so I think that is a of great danger to not only uh, uh, Israel, but the Sunni nations. And I see this, uh, you see an unprecedented coalition of Israel and many of these Sunni nations that are getting together, uh, sometimes covertly, sometimes a little bit more publicly than ever been done, to try to present a united front against Iran, which desires to be uh, the regional superpower. And beyond that, they have global ambitions. They really want to take their brand of Shiite Islam around the world and establish a global caliphate, uh, a Shiite brand. Our, our current administration seems to even be cooperating with that, bringing that coalition together a bit. Exactly. I mean, the, the recent visit by President Trump, not only to Saudi Arabia, but here to Israel, and uh, really, I think, changed in a, in a great way the previous administration, the Obama administration. It really spent their two terms sort of being more friendly to Iran, being appeasing to Iran, and that really threatened both Israel and terrified Sunni nations like Saudi Arabia. So him, uh, President Trump, going to Saudi Arabia, then coming here, I think you see a, a, a growing coalition presenting a united front against Iran. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. You know, the, the, the sense in the kind of the global media is that the Jewish people are the problem in the Middle East. And the radical Islamic viewpoint is if they could do away with the Jewish people and the state of Israel, that there would be peace in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But my opinion's always been if they did away, Israel's at the point of the spear. Right. If they could push the Jewish people away, we're next. Exactly. Does yeah. it seem that way? You certainly have more experience in the region than I do. Well, very much so. I think they, uh, they are at the tip of the spear. In fact, we were talking to somebody just last night that, uh, that the, the Jewish state is really fighting for democracy, not only here in the Middle East, but I think they, they represent the front lines for the Western world and Western civilization. And I think that Israel, despite what the media may say or may the enemies of Israel may accuse them, uh, they're presenting, I think, uh, not only democracy, but technology. They're, they're uh, presenting this, these new medical breakthroughs, agricultural breakthroughs. They're being a blessing uh, in the midst of the earth. They're being a light to the nations uh, like the Bible said they were. So I think if you removed Israel, there'd be a lot more darkness in the Middle East. Uh, they, they really uh, present a an amazing counterpoint to what's happening with groups like ISIS. To give you an example, Alan, many people may not know, but, uh, but Jew Jews up on the northern border, they have Israeli hospitals that are treating the victims of the Syrian civil war by the thousands. And it's very, uh, it's very quiet, but they have medical hospitals up there that, that uh, they treat women, children, even they, they treat some of the fighters uh, of ISIS or maybe these other radical groups as they come over and uh, treat the wounded. And I think that exemplifies what the Jewish state means here in the region. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. Well, let's talk about Israel for a minute because it really is a miracle to see how they're flourishing mm -hmm. in this cauldron of hatred. And the, I mean, there's some pretty difficult seasons, but the, Israel is really changing and emerging yeah. I mean, their economy, their agriculture, their high-tech corridors. 
in so many ways. This is not a developing nation anymore. This is a first world nation. Yeah, yeah. very much so. I mean, if you look back at the founding of the nation almost 70 years ago, uh, they were really struggling for survival. Even 50 years ago in 1967, again, there was a battle for survival when all the Arab nations around it were trying to annihilate it and uh, push it into the sea. And uh, so they've gone through 1982, the second, oh, the first, second, first Lebanon war in uh, 2006. We were on the front lines of the second Lebanon war. So they've had a history of war, and yet the fact that they have survived, and not only survived, but thrived. And as you said, these technological breakthroughs, uh, ways is one thing that, uh, that yes. has helped the world. Helped Mobile eye is another thing. Uh, they have uh, smart pill, medical technology that, that is really having breakthroughs around the world, agricultural. The drip irrigation is really changing the world. It ha certainly has changed agriculture here in Israel. And so it's an amazing uh, testimony to what, how God has blessed the Jewish people. And, uh, and, and one other NFL anecdote, um, Myra Kraft, who is the uh, w former wife of Robert Kraft, said, you know, you're not going to win any Super Bowls unless you help Israeli football uh, here in, in Israel. And when he did, he won the, second, the first Super Bowl two years later. Now he's won five. Now, whether or not that's a, a cause and effect, but I think it shows you when you bless Israel, uh, you will be blessed, and, uh, and certainly Israel's blessing the world. Um, uh, we met Mr. Kraft in a hotel here, and mm -hmm. if his success is an indicator, there'll be a lot of NFL investment, I believe, in Israel. Exactly. exactly. It's remarkable to see what's happening. But there's another change that I think we see, too, and there used to be a great deal of antagonism between the Christian community, probably started on the Christian community and the Jewish people, mm -hmm. I mean, historically. Right. But it seems to me in recent years there's been a lot of healing come in those places, too. And I feel on the streets of Jerusalem, even the Israelis are more comfortable with the evangelicals and mm -hmm. the Christian community. Do you see that oh, happening? Oh, I think it's been a revolution. I think when we came here in 2000, the, first, the second intifada began. And because of the terror attacks, uh, tourism dropped dramatically. The one group that kept coming were evangelical Christians. And I think that said a lot to Israelis, that they would stand with them uh, in a dark hour. And I think beyond that, uh, there has been such a renewed relationship, despite the 2,000-year history uh, of, of anti-Semitism by the church in many times. Uh, we see groups like Christian Friends of Yad Vashem. We see uh, Christian Friends of Magen David Adom. Uh, we see people working, Christians working with the Jewish Agency and other groups. And I, I think the relationships that are growing today between evangelical Christians and Jewish groups uh, here in Israel and around the world is unprecedented. And I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful sign of... Uh, the Jewish people embracing evangelical Christians who want to bless Israel and who see that uh, Genesis 12, 2 and 3 is, is, uh, works today, that those that bless Israel would be blessed. And there's, a, there's a, just a profound love of, uh, of for Israel and the Jewish people by the evangelical church. And I've talked to people at the ICEJ, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, and uh, they see this spreading uh, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, and, and uh, this, this love for Israel and, and blessing Israel is going worldwide among evangelical Christians. That's exciting. Well, we see anti-Semitism growing. We see the Christians awakening to that. Mm -hmm. that's, exactly. that's a very, very hopeful trend. May yeah. it increase. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a time to stand with Israel because there's an attempt in many ways around the world to delegitimize the Jewish state. The BDS movement, boycott, divest, and sanction movement is one aspect of that, one manifestation of that. And, and I think whether it's the United Nations as well, uh, UN Security Resolution 2334 said that what we see back here, the old city of Jerusalem, is occupied Palestinian territory. UNESCO has voted resolutions that deny any relation of the Jewish people to places like the Western Wall and the Temple Mount. And so these are attempts to delegitimize uh, the Jewish state, and that's why it's very important for evangelical Christians to stand with Israel for such a time as this. Absolutely. You know, there's a, there's a couple of misconceptions that have thrived in the church. One was that the, God rejected the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And that's not a new idea. It goes all the way back to the New Testament. It's addressed in the book of Romans. Paul said, God forbid. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the other idea that we don't understand is the, that the Jewish people historically have been persecuted more by the Christians than any other group on the planet. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to my, my friends at home, they don't understand that. But yeah. from an Israeli standpoint today, the 
the kids look at the Holocaust and they think it was perpetrated by Christians. Exactly. You know, and yeah. we say, well, not Christians like us, but th that subtlety and nuance is lost on the people who suffered mm -hmm. there. And so it's thrilling to see the healing that is beginning in between those communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Exactly, and, and, and as you said, the, uh, a lot of people don't understand the, uh, the 2,000 year old history, and that explains why there has been such a reluctance for many Jews and Jewish groups to, to sort of be at arm's length of many of these uh, evangelical Christians or churches, and, and yet we do see that healing process uh, taking place and the walls are coming down, uh, hearts are softening. Absolutely, and may it continue and yeah. grow. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. It's, uh, it's an exciting day in the land of Israel to see the desalination plants. They've got more water than they need for yeah. the first time in their history. Mm -hmm. I, I can hardly wait to see which part of the desert blooms next. Because <laughs> when I was here in 2000 and for several years, uh, there was a real concern every year. How much rainfall is Israel going to have, which would fill up uh, the Jordan River or the or snows on Mount Hermon that would melt and then go into the Sea of Galilee, uh, their largest fresh uh, body water uh, that, that provided fresh water for the whole state of Israel. And now because of the desalination, they really do have a surplus. Uh, part of the technology that they have developed and they're exporting that technology to some of their neighbors and around the world. It, it has the potential to make a tremendous impact in the Middle East and the world. That's right. Yeah, because a lot of people thought that wars were going to be fought over water, and sometimes they have been. And, uh, and water being so scarce in this region, uh, you can imagine why they would be fighting over the sources of water. There's a beautiful symmetry to it. God's blessed the whole world through the history that's happened in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and he's doing it again. Yeah, yeah, you he know, is. He's doing it with the technology, but he's going to do it when the Messiah comes back here as well. That's right, that's right. We live in a pretty exciting day. Ex uh, very exciting. You know, we were interviewing David Parsons of the ICEJ not yes. long ago about whether or not the United States would move the embassy over here from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He made a fascinating point. He said in 1867, Charles Warren, a British archaeologist, discovered the old city of Jerusalem that had really been hidden for centuries. Uh, Fifty years later, General Allenby went through the Jaffa Gate here in uh, just behind us uh, when the British took over. 1967, 50 years later, uh, for the first time in more than 2,000 years, the Jewish people controlled the old city of Jerusalem. And now he says 50 years later, 2017, what will be the prophetic fulfillment? Mm -hmm. And uh, as he was saying, uh, Jerusalem keeps walking and stepping into its prophetic fulfillment uh, until the Lord comes back right there on the Mount of Olives. What a privilege we have to be, yeah. to be participants in what God is doing. It's an amazing time to be alive. Yeah. Chris, I thank you for what you do. Thank you, Alan. On behalf of yeah. the CBN News and helping mm -hmm. keep Christians all over the world informed and yeah. aware for your courage and your sacrifice. You make a difference for us, and we want to thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Chris brought some things I want to share with you. There's a, a video. It's a DVD of In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. tells the story. Yeah, it tells a story about the 55th Paratrooper Brigades and other brigades that helped capture the old city of Jerusalem. It's a docudrama because it's a documentary, but it also has dramatic reenactments uh, of the battle. It includes many of the paratroopers that actually were in the battle. Uh, it's fascinating, and the reviews that I've had from it uh, have been extraordinary. We showed it here as a premiere here in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, many people are just some, sometimes speechless about it. I've had people uh, nearly in tears uh, when they talk about it and see what's happened. It's a great story uh, of the history and the prophetic history of, of uh, Israel. And then you brought me your latest book. It's ISIS, Iran, and Israel. Yes, yeah, we, we wrote, I wrote that to help people, as you're doing right now in, the, in your shows, your TV shows, as you bring people over here to introduce them to the land to help understand the Middle East. And being here is a privilege of being here on the front lines of Israel's history or the history of the Middle East. My attempt in the book, ISIS, Iran, and Israel, help people in the West, in the United States in particular, understand what's happening over here in the region. It's, it is possible to have a better understanding of what's happening. I know some people may look at the news, they see one more terror attack, one more suicide bombing, and they just say, why don't people just get along over here? It might be a blur. So the idea is to help people be like the sons of Issachar to understand the times and know what Israel should do. All right, so if our friends want to get a copy of either one of these, where do they find them? Uh, for the book, you can go to Amazon.com. For the docudrama, you can go to CBN.com. All right, thank you for your hard work. Okay, thanks, Alan. Before we go, I want to take just a moment with you. You know, to visit Israel is to see God doing a miracle before our very eyes. 
but he's not just doing miracles in Jerusalem. He's doing them wherever you live. I know he's doing them in Murfreesboro, my home, and I'm quite certain he's doing them in yours. But when I visit here, I realize that miracles emerge through the, the stress and the strains of life, and that's going to happen in your life too. God doesn't do miracles in the vacuum. He doesn't deliver us from all. He delivers us through our troubles. And I want to encourage you not to give up. You know, that God, there's no question that Jerusalem stands under the sovereign, can watchful eye of God. But the IDF still puts their planes in the sky and the young men and women of Israel still, still go stand on the front lines. And you and I have to put our faith on the front lines and walk through the struggles and the trials and the difficulties of our lives. And just as much as Jerusalem is flourishing, God's will, purposes will flourish in your life. I want to pray for you before we go that you won't give up, that God will give you the wisdom and the courage, the breakthroughs you need to stand firm in this season. The Spirit of God is moving in the earth, and you and I have the privilege of participating. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the time together with Chris, for the city of Jerusalem and the people of this land, what you're doing here. And I pray for every person that's been able to be a part of this program. Lord, you know the details and the circumstances. I pray you'll give us your strength to stand. May we not grow weary. May we not be overcome with fear or intimidation, but we may, may we stand strong in Jesus' name. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your love for us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you from Jerusalem. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online at intendministries.org and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.